evening and good afternoon, and welcome to another edition of the SoCal Sports Sports Show. We have ourselves a decent size to be the sports for Southern California to discuss, such as the Dodgers and the Angels both struggling. Angels scores particularly because they lost eight in a row, they were just swept by the Yankees, and they were also swept by the Toronto Blue Jays. Something must be done. We have to change. My goodness. And how about the LA Galaxy? Pulling off another big win over Austin FC. Can they keep up this big momentum going forward? And unfortunately, San Diego Wave FC and Angel City FC only lost this past weekend. And then so, what? It's all good. It's still early in the season. There's still no way. There's still no way. And welcome one, welcome all to another edition of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. Thank you for joining me on this beautiful Friday afternoon. I hope you all are having a great start to your weekend. I hope you all had a great weekend last weekend. I know I did for the most part, even though I had to work on Memorial Day weekend. Without any further delay, let's get on in to Southern California sports goodness. But first, a word from our sponsor iSports Radio is proud to call the Southern California Warriors the official sponsor of iSports Radio. The world of semi-pro sports is unlike any other sports organization. Players pay to play in hopes of so many different outcomes, whether it's playing to get filmed to try out for professional teams, big-time colleges, or just playing to stay in shape. No matter what, all semi-pro players have one thing in common, and that's playing for the love of the game. The South Cal Warriors have been on a quest to earn titles and give players second chances since 2017. Whether you're in Southern California or anywhere in the world, give semi-pro sports a chance if you love your sport. You may get that second chance you've been waiting for as an athlete. You can follow them on Twitter at SoCal Warriors, on Instagram at Southern California underscore Warriors, and on Facebook by typing in the word Southern California and then Warriors. And then IE Sports Radio, our main station, is on Twitter and on Instagram at IE Sports Radio. And on Facebook, by typing in the word IE, then sports, then radio. And then when you go to the, our website, www.iesportsradio.com, you will see a Patreon link at the top with five different tiers. The first one starts out at $5 a month, and this will get you a shout-out from all 31 of our shows. And higher tiers will include IE Sports Radio merchandise, access to IESRU, the podcasting university of IE Sports Radio, and even a chance to be featured on IE Sports Radio's segment of their flagship show, The Defining Moment with Larry B. Because for the past eight years, IE Sports Radio has been bringing you amazing, amazing content, ranging from interviewing legendary athletes, coaches, and other authorized media personnel to building tailor-made shows dedicated to all major sports cities around the country. All the while, we've been continuing to be by the fans and for the fans, and with your help, we are ready to take the next biggest step. Thank you, everyone, for all of your support and for continuing to make iSports Radio your direct feed for all that sports. Shout to our four Patreon supporters, Bay Area Raised Apparel, Marcus Los Great, Key to the Gate, and an, an Anonymous supporter. 
Also, I have to give a shout out to iSports Sports Radio's fan of the month, Justin Ekstrom. He is a Minnesota Vikings fan, hailing from Minnesota. Shout out to my boy Vince Young, Vince Wright, the sports governor, as Justin Ekstrom proudly supports Seventh Street Pizza, which is absolutely delicious. I imagine I haven't gone to Seventh Street Pizza, but I imagine it's good. You can catch it at your local supermarket in Minnesota. Also, his sports crib, Justin Ekstrom Sports, or Justin Ekstrom's Twitter account is at the Sports Crib. And we also got to give a shout out to everyone who made iSports Radio's eighth year anniversary super special. Here's to many more iSports Radio anniversaries to come. Now let's get on into the Southern California sports action. We don't have too many teams going on right now. All we have is the NWSL happening, which is Angel City FC and San Diego Wave FC. Then you have the Los Angeles Sparks and the WNBA. Then you've got the MLS with the Galaxy and LAFC. Then you've got the MLB going on with the Padres, Dodgers, and Angels. And that's pretty much it. The NBA is obviously boiled down to the Golden State Warriors and the Boston Celtics. Both of those teams not in Southern California. And then the NFL doesn't start until probably August where the preseason begins and whatnot. And then... I would talk NVA, but I've already discussed NVA on my other show, Set Point, which airs every Monday at 6 p.m. Pacific Time, 9 p.m. Eastern, but I digress on that. So we'll start off with the MLB. So the Angels have been absolutely atrocious. We're going to start with the Angels just because they have been absolutely atrocious. They have lost eight in a row. They're currently down 4 nothing to the Phillies, which <laughs> the Phillies just recently fired their manager, Joe Girardi, and they're beating the Angels for nothing. I am sickened by this. Absolutely sickened to my core. This is just terrible, dude. Like, I'm sorry, but this is just sad. Like, the Angels, once again, the Angels were off to an amazing start. They're looking really interesting in the eyes of everybody. And now they've come crashing down to earth. I am disappointed by this. Absolutely disgusting. Like I said, they just recently got swept in their series against the New York Yankees. They lost the first game on Tuesday, 9-1. to Their second game was postponed and had to be played on Thursday in a doubleheader. So the Angels lost that one 6-1, to and then they lost the second one of the doubleheader 2-1. to The 2-1 to loss was very disheartening just because they only got two hits, and the Yankees had a perfect game going on through about, like, through eight innings. As Jameson Talon basically... basically was just wheeling and dealing. And that's just darn right impressive. I can't get mad at that, honestly. Eight innings pitched, one earned run, five strikeouts. Perfect game going through to the eight innings, which is darn right impressive. Like, if the Yankees did not get those two runs, or if the Yankees didn't give up that r- one run in the top of the eighth inning, I think he could have gone the distance and gone a- gotten a complete game. But either way, it's just darn right disappointing because the Angels had that one. And with the offense that the Angels have, you would think they would be putting up like so many more runs. You can't walk into a series against the New York Yankees and expect to win if you're just putting up three runs in the entire series. Three runs in the entire series, and one of which came all in all in one of those games. Which, to me, it's just, it really is frustrating as an Angels fan. Just because the Angels, once again, doing great to start off. Everyone was thinking, mm, maybe this team could actually make the playoffs. Now we're getting doubts, and now it's looking like the Angels are starting to unravel, which is disappointing. They have the Phillies this weekend. They have to figure it out against the Phillies. If they don't, then I think it's officially time to throw in the towel. I don't mean to say it like that. I know it's super early. I know they're, what, 56 games in? But it's just darn right frustrating just because 52 games. My apologies, 52 games. They're 52 games into the season. They're unraveling at the wrong time and if they're unraveling right now I can only imagine what's going to happen to them going forward just because you know 
the Angels always seem to do this. They always seem to get everyone's attention. They always have a few good series wins, a few good wins here and there. And then they start to go on this cold streak where they can't seem to hit on the side of a barn, let alone they, their pitching starts to become complete dog do. And then that, I should also mention that second game, the Yankees just pretty much swallowed up Shohei Otani. Like, they really did damage to Shohei Otani, which was disappointing. It seems like Shohei Otani still can't seem to beat the New York teams, which whether it's the Mets or the Yankees. I really am just frustrated by this. As an Angels fan, I really want to see the Angels do good. But they always seem to have this problem of continuing their hot start to the season or their winning streak as of that said winning streak to begin with, which I really don't like. And I really hope the Angels can turn it around, but I'm starting to have my doubts come and creep in. The bullpen is looking very atrocious. They're starting to get into the gist of their schedule. It's now starting to look like they're going to struggle against the big-time teams. And then they still have some teams coming up that are still pretty good as well. Like, they've got the Phillies, which is kind of their only breather. But after the Phillies, they've got the Red Sox, which they're starting to play much better. Like, you can't compare the Red Sox from now all the way to when they played the Angels back when the season began or back when I was in Dallas-Fort Worth, but I digress. Then after the Red Sox, they have the Mets, then the Dodgers, the Mariners could try to get back on track, as that's a five-game series. Woo. And then it starts to lighten up a little with those with that five-game series against the Mariners. Then they've got a three-game series against the Royals, then another three-game series against the Mariners, then they've got a three-game series against the White Sox, which I imagine will be... Not a four-game series. It is a three-game series. Then they start off the month of July against the Astros. So looking at the schedule, the Angels really have to come up big. I don't expect them to beat the Mets or the Dodgers all that much. I mean, luckily they only have a two-game series against the Dodgers. But the Mets are really good. And the Red Sox are getting so much better. So for me, if the Angels can't solve this problem in the series against the Phillies... You could already chalk losses up to the Mets, the Dodgers, and the Red Sox. I really just don't understand why the Angels can't seem to be competent enough to, like, get it together. It really, really is frustrating, and I really wish they can get their you-know-what together. Now that I mentioned the Mets and the Dodgers, the Dodgers are the perfect segue to go into the next topic when it comes to the MLB. So the Dodgers recently had a three games. They recently got swept by the Pittsburgh Pirates, and I'm just baffled at how they got swept. So the first game they lost 6-5 to five on Monday, which they actually came back from 4 nothing down, led 5-4 going into the ninth, lost that lead, and they couldn't recover as they eventually lost that game. Then they lost 5-3 against the Pirates on Tuesday, and then they completed getting swept by losing 8-4 to the Pirates. Now, it was the game was played at Dodger Stadium, and this was actually the first time the Pirates swept the Dodgers since 2000. That's how long it's been since the Dodgers got swept by the Pirates. Now, obviously, th- sweeps like this happen... I understand things like this happen of the sort. However, I wasn't really expecting the Pirates. I know the Pirates have a really good young core. I also know that the Pirates don't really have much to lose when it comes to playing these games. Everyone expects to count them out. Everyone thinks, oh, it's just the Pirates. They're not going to do much. But they're actually doing good, and they're, they kind of remind me of the Detroit Lions from this past season. No one really expects much out of them, but they make winning and losing fun. They're always competitive. And that's kind of how I describe the Pittsburgh Pirates. In their series before the Pirates, they swept the Dodgers swept the Diamondbacks, which was obviously kind of expected, but you know. You know what I mean. So for the Dodgers, they did get back on track, which is the good news, as they beat the Mets 2-0. Kind of impressed that they were able to keep it together as they held him only three hits, which is not bad. Big shot to Tani Gonsolin, who pitched six innings. 
He only allowed one walk and had five strikeouts. So good stuff from the Dodgers, and Corey Kimbrell got the save. So good for them. And Mookie Betts is still doing great things as Mookie is a Dodger. (laughs) Mookie is starting to snap out of his little funk. So I think that Pirates series loss was kind of a little blip on the radar. I just don't want the Dodgers to like lose games like that ever again. Like I think now Dodgers fans are going to start to cool off, say, okay, we're back to winning games against the Mets, and I think we're going to get the ship rightened, and we're going to win from here. So the Dodgers play the Mets at 7, 10 p.m. Pacific time. Believe it or not, the Mets actually have a better record than the Dodgers, but a win for the Dodgers would tie both teams' record at 35 and 18. And then Saturday and Sunday, the Dodgers and Mets face one another. I kind of am surprised that the Sunday matchup between the Mets and the Dodgers does not feature them on ESPN Sunday Night Baseball. I really think that deserves to be Sunday Night Baseball's game of the week. It was because it's the Mets and the Dodgers. Both those teams are really good. But I guess people didn't really have like expectations for the Mets this year. But I really would like to see that matchup getting flexed. I don't even know what the ma- the match of the week is, honestly. But... Overall, I think the Dodgers are starting to get it together. They have a four-game series lead over the Padres in the NL West. And while the NL West is still the best division, you still have other teams that are doing good, like the Cardinals in the NL Central. The Braves are starting to do better, but that's kind of where the buck stops because then it goes San Diego Padres following the Cardinals, and then it goes Giants and then so on and so forth. It's a massive drop from Grace following the San Diego Pod or San Francisco Giants. So there's that right there. And speaking of the Padres, it is perfect segue to go into them. Now, with all the frustration about the Dodgers and especially the Angels, I forgot all about these little fellas. So the Padres, believe it or not, have also been struggling. <laughs> They just recently got swept by the St. Louis Cardinals. Now, like I said, the Cardinals are still pretty good. But on Monday, they lo- they lost to the Cardinals 6-3 to three on Monday, lost in 10 innings to the Cardinals 3-2, to two, and then on Wednesday, they lost to the Cardinals 5-2, to two, and then yesterday they lost to the Milwaukee Brewers 5-4. to four. That's kind of the big matchup of the week. I'm surprised that, too, is not the matchup of the week on ESPN. I really got to see what the frick is Sunday Night Baseball. I really want to see that. But either way, currently right now, the Padres are up one nothing in the bottom of the first inning against the Brewers. The series is in Milwaukee. So, yeah, cool beans right there. So if the Padres could get at least two out of four or split the series, if they get three, then awesome. But Two would be sufficient. Following this series, well, I actually should mention that their previous series against the Pittsburgh Pirates, they took two out of three. They beat the Pirates in the first game four to three, lost to the Pirates in the second game four to two, and then beat the Pirates in ten innings on Sunday four to two. Now jumping over to the series following the Brewers, the Padres don't have a breather as they actually have to head back to Petco Park to take on the New York Mets. And then following that, they have the Colorado Rockies, which are the most night and day team in all of the MLBs for the most part. And then they have the Chicago Cubs, which I think they can handle. They should be able to handle quite easily. The Cubs aren't necessarily the best team in the shed, but they're certainly not the worst. So we'll see what happens when it comes to that little moment right there. I think the Padres, they're still in a good situation. I really think as long as they hold their ground, they should be able to do what they do. And they have to keep pace with the Dodgers. There's no better way of saying it. And after that Cubs series, they've got the Rockies at Colorado. They've got the Diamondbacks and the Phillies and the Diamondbacks again. And then, At the end of the month, they have a four-game series, starting with a Thursday game against the Dodgers, and then going into the first week of July, they have the Dodgers 
on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of that first week of July. So basically, the Padres could be in for an all-you-can-eat buffet of wins following their series against the Mets and Brewers, of course. To get there, they have to actually do decently against the Brewers and the Mets. And if they take four out of seven against the Mets and the Brewers combined, I think they should be in good shape. They just have to beat those teams that they're supposed to beat. They have to do what the Angels can't seem to do and actually beat the teams that they're, they're supposed to beat. It really – and the Dodgers for that most for that part. So overall, Padres are in a good situation. They – their slump against the Cardinals kind of came at an inconvenient time just because the Dodgers – that basically cancels out the Dodgers' rotten luck against the Pittsburgh Pirates. So the Padres re- had a golden opportunity to basically move past the Dodgers or move close to the Dodgers in the NL West, but unfortunately they blew it. But there's still plenty of season left. There's lots of season left. We're already – We're not even 100 games left remaining into the season. So I think the Padres will be just fine. We just got to hope for Padres' sake that they don't have another collapse like they did last season. That was terrible. (laughs) That little nightmare where the Padres start to unravel right before our very eyes. And, oh, gosh, that's bringing up so many bad memories. On a brighter note, once the Padres get back Fernando Tatis Jr., they should be guaranteeing themselves wins on a nightly basis for the most part. They just have to basically stay consistent. They basically have to do what the Angels aren't doing. So that is that for the MLB discussion. I know I kind of cruised through that, but what can you do? Jumping on over into ZMLS... The Galaxy actually had themselves quite an impressive win this past Sunday as they beat Austin FC 4-1. to The first goal actually did not come until the 53rd minute when Diego Fagundes scored and that put every Galaxy fan on the edge of their seat. However, the Galaxy scored eight minutes after that as Javier Hernandez scored and then Dejan Hovlicic scored back-to-back goals to give the Galaxy a 3-1 lead. And then the 90th minute, Efren Alvarez scored to make it 4-1. And eventually the Galaxy were able to knock off Austin FC. So that's the good news for the Galaxy. As in addition to that, the Galaxy, like I mentioned last episode, they beat LAFC in the U.S. Open Cup. So now they're in the quarterfinals, which is awesome. That's the good news for the Galaxy overall. And we're all... It's all basically happiness and unicorns and rainbows, right? Because the Galaxy don't have another match until Saturday, June 18th, when they play Portland at the, I was about to say StubHub Center, but, oh, I'm blank. I'm actually blanking on the name. It's the Dignity Health Sports Park. I'm trying not to say StubHub Center. It'll forever be StubHub Center to me in my heart, but I digress. But the Galaxy don't have another game until they play the Portland Timbers on June 18th. So everything looks good in the hood for the Galaxy, right? Uh, Not really, because the Galaxy are still in fifth place. Yes, despite, despite beating Austin for a second time in this past month or so, they're still in fifth place in the Western Conference. Mind equals boggled. And you know what's even worse? Austin is right ahead of them with one point as they are fourth in the Western Conference with 24 points compared to the Galaxy's 23. So, oh my gosh, that is a little frustrating, but you also kind of have to remember the Galaxy lost a few games that they kind of should have won. They lost to the Dynamo. They lost to Dallas FC. It was, And then they also tied with Minnesota, which is darn right embarrassing well not embarrassing but it's just frustrating because that's basically what's holding the galaxy back from jumping austin and a few of these other teams in the mls so oh well i mean i i'm happy that that the galaxy was able to defeat austin it's it's a very good win especially since they were able to beat him twice in one month like darn right impressive however it's just disheartening just because 
they're still behind them, and they're behind a team that has a goal differential of zero, a.k.a. Real Salt Lake. So, yeah, it's pretty frustrating, and like I said, the Galaxy don't have another match until the 18th, which is basically them staying on staying behind from the field trip while other teams are just trying to catch up to them based on number of matches played. So it's good that the Galaxy are getting back to their winning ways because following Nashville, which is right behind them in the West Western Conference standings, the drop off goes from seven seven and eight, which is Houston and Minnesota and Colorado, and then all the way down, which Seattle is actually at sixteen points, which could be something to watch for. I mean, the C- Seattle the Seattle Sounders won the CONCACAF Cup, which it still makes me wonder, why are they 10th in the Western Conference? But I'm not going to ask questions. We're going to jump on over to LAFC, which managed to beat San Jose 3-2 to in their little rivalry game, which is nice because LAFC bounced back from their loss to the Galaxy in their little U.S. Open Cup. LAFC got on the board first with a penalty kick from Christian Arango. Then Ryan Hollingshed added a goal to make it 2 nothing. But then San Jose added a goal three minutes after as Jeremy Ebabis scored. And then he scored another goal at the 31st minute to tie it up at 2-2. That was eventually the halftime score until Brian Rodriguez, no relation to me, scored at the 47th minute to give LAFC the eventual go-ahead goal, which gave him the 3-2 win, which is very solid because that keeps LAFC ahead of the pack in the Western Conference, and it doesn't, like, borderline them of possibly losing that Western Conference conference lead and whatnot. So I really think that LAFC has improved. Like, I'll give LAFC this. They're so much better than last year, and they're winning the games they're supposed to be winning – even though they did tie to Philadelphia, but Philadelphia was good at the time. They were the number one team in the East at the time. So we could forgive them for that. And then we could also forgive them for the losses to Colorado and Austin, especially since they followed that up with wins over Columbus and San Jose. We could throw out the Galaxy loss as of recent because that U.S. Open Cup, El Trafico, does not mean anything for the MLS standings. That LA Galaxy loss for LAFC doesn't mean squat. What matters most is winning the MLS games, and if LAFC can do that, then they're golden for the playoffs. Much like the Galaxy, they do not have another match until June 18th when they hit the road to Lumen Field to take on the Seattle Sounders. Now, that Seattle matchup is going to be very interesting just because the Sounders, they are currently in 10th place. However... That does not mean Seattle is not a good ball club. And also, LAFC kind of has a little rivalry with the Sounders. I really don't think anyone's going to be sleeping on Seattle, as Seattle also, prior to that game, has a matchup against Vancouver on Tuesday, June 14th. So it looks like the Sounders, the Galaxy, and LAFC, as well as most of the MLS, have a nice little break, and then I guess they like go into, like, the U.S. Open Cup. I'm not the biggest soccer expert. That's Andrew Hagenbaugh. Definitely do check out the Soccer Scoreboard Show every Sunday at 7 p.m. Pacific Time, 10 p.m. Eastern, for all of your soccer goodness and whatnot. So, back to the Sounders and LFC. I think that one is kind of going to be an interesting matchup for LFC. LFC will be able to see how Seattle plays against Vancouver. And then depending on what happens with Vancouver and Seattle should depend on what happens with Seattle going into Saturday's match. Like, Seattle could be gassed. They could also be motivated in case they win or they somehow lose, and then they have to basically be in gut check time. Regardless, I really think LAFC should be able to win that match against Seattle. If they do, then bully for them. They have – they could – they need all the wins they can get, especially since Dallas is right on their coattails, Real Salt Lake is on their coattails, and even Austin is on their coattails. Like, currently the LAFC has 29 points, which is nice, but they could do so much better. Like, losing those games to Colorado and Austin really kind of hurt them. 
as Colorado, like I said, they're kind of in a log jam for the seventh spot with Houston and Minnesota. And then Austin has definitely been the surprise team of the MLS, like I've said in the past. I really think Austin has done an outstanding job. For the Galaxy, however, it seems like they have their number, though. Like, it's darn right impressive that the Galaxy have their number. But jumping back to LAFC, I think LAFC just needs their consistency to continue on. And they have to keep themselves injury-free and whatnot. And they no longer have the pressure of winning or losing the U.S. Open Cup. Obviously, that loss to the Galaxy really stung just because LAFC losing the LA Galaxy is not fun. It's no, nowhere near fun losing a home match, a, a, a rivalry game to your crosstown rival, especially when it's on the road. And I did see that LAFC fans were swarming to Dignity Health Sports Park. So... There's that right there for LFC, and who knows what can happen with the with LFC going forward. After their matchup against Seattle, LFC has the New York Red Bulls, which is actually fourth in the Eastern Conference. So that could be a challenging matchup. It is going to be at Bank of California Stadium, and yes, I got it right. I finally knew the LFC's home stadium by heart. So yeah, it is at Bank of Amer- Bank of California Stadium. As soon as I said it, I said Bank of America. <laughs> and then LAFC closes out the month of June with a match against Dallas at home, which, boy howdy, that could be huge right there. If serve holds between Dallas and LAFC, then that matchup right there could be for first place. And heaven knows what could happen as Dallas plays Vancouver and they also play Austin going after the following the break. So, and that's a Wednesday game. You also have to factor in that it's a Wednesday game. And that's going to be quite interesting right, right there. So we'll see what happens with LAFC and the LA galaxy, but I'm liking what I'm seeing with those two. If they can keep it up, they're both playoff bound. So now we'll jump over. Actually, no, we'll take ourselves a quick little commercial break. You break, give my voice a little rest And then when we come back, we will discuss some NWSL action, and we'll talk some WNBA. Then we'll get into the what-ifs, then the dum-dum of the week, and then I'll send you all on your way. We also have another show going on. It's North Star Sports with Minnesota Mike, a.k.a. Michael Christensen. He will be going on at 6.30 p.m. Pacific Time, 8.30 p.m. Central Time. So we're going to have to wrap up whenever we can. But I will give you all what you want and what you need, like Marcus Lowe's great. Either way, we'll make it work. You're listening to the SoCal Supreme Sports Show here on iSports Radio, your direct feed for all that sports. We'll be right back after this. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Davidson. It's your boy, the entire lot. And we are the hosts of Fast Break here on IE Sports Radio, where we discuss everything in the world of basketball from prep to the pros. You guys definitely check us out, man. Sunday, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. We got all the basketball information you guys need. So we look forward to you guys listening in. And please do, because we are the best basketball show on this side of the Mississippi. And please do check us out on Twitter at Fastbreak ISR. D Lock, where's our time again? 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. And give you guys spending time on a Sunday. Tune in.
It's IE Sports Radio. It is your direct feed for all that is sports. It is Philly Sports Talk with Cash and Chris every Tuesday night right here on IE Sports Radio. Your direct feed for all that is sports. Philly Sports Talk with Cash and Chris is the most comprehensive view on Philadelphia sports exclusively right here on IE Sports Radio. You know what it is. Your direct feed for all that is sports. Tuesday night, IE Sports Radio, Philly Sports Talk with Cash and Chris. It's your boy, Marcus Los Great. Here to give you what you want. Here to give you what you need. Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> I'm coming to you live. Straight from your mama's basement with a crispy awesome white tea. <laughs> We are coming to you live every Tuesday at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Powered by IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. That's right, everybody. I told y'all, my boy Marcus is here to give us what you want. He's here to give us what you need. And he's here to do so in a crispy, I repeat, a crispy white tea. (laughs) So anyway, welcome back to the second half of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. Hope you all are doing well. Definitely check out Fast Break every Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific Time, 8 p.m. Eastern. Philly Sports Talk every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Pacific Time, 8 p.m. Eastern. And then Gloves gloves Off every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific Time, 11 p.m. Eastern Time. It's def- They're all great shows. We all are passionate about our sports and whatnot. So definitely do check out all of our amazing shows on IE Sports Radio. We have wrestling. We have volleyball. We have basketball. We have shows dedicated to cities such as Chicago, Buffalo. We even have a Northern California sports show. Definitely do check out all of our shows. I guarantee you, you won't be disappointed. Now let's get back on into the action. So let's jump to the NWSL. As Adam, big shout out to Adam who pops in the chat room. He says, what's good in the world of Southern Cal- in the world of SoCal? Well, I discussed the MLB and the MLS. We were about to discuss some some NWSL. He says, how's Joe Madden doing out in L.A.? Still loving life? Yeah, Joe Madden is loving life despite this atrocious eight-game losing streak that the Angels have been on. Uh, it's been tough times as they're currently down 8 nothing to the Phillies, and it's only the fifth inning. Oh, my goodness. Like, the Angels... Again, the Phillies just fired Joe Girardi, and they're down eight no- and the Angels are down eight nothing to the Phillies, who just fired their manager earlier today. Absolutely sickening. This is just this is just unacceptable for the Angels. So we're gonna get away from the Angels. We're gonna get into some NWSL, starting with San Diego Wave FC. So unfortunately for San Diego, they. Lost to OL Reign. They lost one nothing, which uh, I feel so horrible for saying this, but well, I kind of jinxed them when I said OL Reign is not that good. But that's what that's the beauty of soccer. Anything can happen so long as you get that golden goal. And it was a one nothing game, so anything could have happened. As OL Reign got the goal from Rose Lavelle, 
So tough, tough loss for San Diego Wave FC, suffering their second loss of the season. As we say hello to Arthur Parsons in the chat room, he says, Taryn, how you doing, Arthur? Hope you had a great show yesterday with the Bayou Bulletin. So that's the bad news for San Diego. The good news is for the Wave is that they are still, still ahead of the NWSL standings. They are, they have a whopping twelve points despite their four zero and two record. So overall, San Diego is still doing having a solid, great start to the season, and I'm rather impressed by them. I really am impressed by what they've done, and I hope they can continue this streak and like i said if the san diego wave fc become the first pro team to bring home a championship to san diego then they deserve a parade and much more just goes to show that women in sports can do things so keep your heads up san diego or wave as san diego has another matchup tomorrow against kansas city on the road so Kansas City is near the bottom of the NWSL standings. However, just like the OL Reign match, San Diego or the Wave cannot underestimate Kansas City. I don't care how bad Kansas City is. I don't care if they're 1-1-4. One, one, and four. They have a goal differential of minus 6. They have to take care of what needs to be done. They cannot, cannot, cannot afford any more losses because they want to vice grip that top spot in the NWSL standings. And I'm not sure about the playoffs now. I know it's really early to be discussing playoffs, especially since we have quite a bit of season to go through. But I imagine it might be top eight teams make the playoffs. But you never know, especially with the MLS and them having top seven teams. So that's something we'll have to discuss next week going forward. So... I should also make note that San Diego has another match fall on Wednesday, this upcoming Wednesday, when they take on Portland back at home in San Diego at Torero Stadium, home of the University of San Diego, which I think that San Diego, well, the Portland Thorns are the OG team of the NWSL. I don't think Portland's going to roll over that easily, even though they have been bad. So that's going to be another wait-and-see matchup. San Diego does, does get another crack at OL Reign as they face them, not this upcoming Sunday, but the following Sunday, June 12th, which that could be that could be kind of pivotal, especially since OL Reign hasn't lost a match the past five matches. They've either tied or they've won, as most their most recent wins were ties, and then they have three draws to their name as well. So we'll see what happens. But overall, it's still... It's still a successful start with the wave, and I only I can only hope that they can continue their hot start as they're, they're doing really well for an expansion team. I really, really think that they have that potential to go deep in the playoffs. <laughs> as Adam says, cure for whatever ails an MLS team or NWSL team. Or, or, you know, Adam says, here for whatever ails an MLS team facing the Chicago Fire. <laughs> That's pretty funny right there, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's pretty funny. I hope that that same that applies for facing the Chicago Red Bulls or Red Stars. My apologies. Red Stars, not the Red Bulls. I'm thinking of the New York Red Bulls. And then Mike Pat pops in the chat room. He says, good evening, Taryn. Good evening, Mike. Hope you're having a great night. Let's jump on over to Angel City FC or Los Angeles. As Angel City FC also took a loss this past weekend. They lost to Gotham or the New Jersey Gotham. one nothing. as Ifioma Onumonu had the lone goal for New Jersey slash New York, which made me sad. I was bummed because that ruined my weekend of soccer, along with the Wave losing. But on the bright side of things, Angel City is still in second place in the NWSL standings. Also, they had themselves quite the big crowd this past weekend. Like, that was a... I think they had, like, the most they've ever had in a in a game, in, or in a match. I don't know the exact number, but I did read in a recent article that 
Angel City FC drew in over like 10,000 or so spectators or or not spectators, fans. So here's hoping that Angel City can continue to do what it does as Angel City FC lost its – well, no, they lost after they had a two-game winning streak. So once again, it's a tough one as they're currently tied for second place with the OL Reign. However, due to them having a better record than the Reign with a 3-0-2 and two record – Angel City FC currently rests in second place by themselves as Angel City's next match will be tonight against Portland. So this is a busy stretch for Angel City FC. I did read that Angel City FC has themselves quite the busy stretch of matches as they have Portland tonight. They have Houston back at the Bank of California Stadium on Tuesday. And then next Saturday, they are on the road against Louisville, which Louisville is kind of in the middle of the pack when it comes to the NWSL. Portland, like I said, the OG team, kind of struggling, but I wouldn't underestimate them. I think that one win, three draw, and one loss record is very misguiding, especially since they have a goal differential of one. So there's that right there. And then the Houston Dash... Also a team not to underestimate, especially since they're they're so close to Angel City. They're fourth in the Western Conference, but they're only, or not Western Conference, the NWSL standings, but they're only one point, one point behind OL Reign and Angel City. So Angel City has to mind their P's and Q's. But to get to Houston, they have to get past Portland. It's a busy stretch for Angel City FC, and if they can get two out of three wins, if not a win, two wins and a draw, like them going two and one would be perfect, but them getting two wins and a draw would also be ideal. And then if they go three and zero, oh, then awesome, and that would be perfect. Especially since they have a big matchup against OL Reign to close out the month of June, and then July they are back home against Portland. But that's looking way too far ahead. So again, Angel City just has to throw that loss away as Gotham. I know Gotham was not the best team as that was only their second win of the season. However, it happens like losses happen. Like look at the Dodgers. They lost, they got swept by the Pittsburgh pirates. Look at the, well, I was going to say, look at the Padres. They lost, they got swept by the St. Louis Cardinals, but the Cardinals are actually halfway decent. So overall losses happen, but it's all about rebounding and all about finding a response. And if you could respond well, then boy howdy, you're in good shape. But if you don't respond well, then the entire, entire league is going to eat you up for breakfast. So that is that for the NWSL standings. As, like I said, the Wave are still in first place while Angel City is right behind them. And then we don't care about the other teams because they're not from Southern California. Fight me if you think otherwise. ha 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 ha. Anyway, so to close out the women's soccer news, we actually have some sad and unfortunate news that I have to report. And it actually comes from the NCAA women's soccer side of things. So, unfortunately, one of USC's top players, Penelope Hawking, has has entered and has officially transferred to... Can we get a drum roll, please? Penelope Hawking is officially transferred from USC, and her new home is Penn State. Yeah, Penn State's getting a really good player. Penelope Hawking is a freaking dynamo. She was one of the reasons why USC had a lot of success this past season. And now she's going over to the Big Ten, and she's going to terrorize the Big Ten, and Penn State is going to be one heck of a powerhouse. But all I can just do is wish Penelope Hawking nothing but the best, and I hope she's able to do big things for Penn State. I just hope it's not against USC. That would be the only slap in the face. But we will miss you, Penelope Hawking. Uh, What if Penelope Hawking stayed with USC? (laughs) I'll get into the what ifs later on. But that's going to do it for that little NCAA women's soccer news. Let's jump on over into the WNBA as Sparks have kind of been on an up-and-down roller coaster ride. 
That's kind of the perfect anomaly to describe them as they start off really good and then they wound up <coughs> falling flat as they kept on winning and losing quite a bit of close games. However, they have won a few games. Their most recent game, they beat the Dallas Wings 93-91 to in a Commissioner's Cup game as, as Neka Omuwike had a double-double. Brittany Sykes had a season-high 25 points. As Despite nearly allowing the Dallas Wings to come back and snatch victory from the Sparks' jaws, they were able to get pull out the win, which made me happy. And the Sparks were able to get the win in the Crypt, a.k.a. Crypto.com Arena. I still am getting used to that. As they also got another big game from Liz Cambridge. And then, like I said, they got 24 points from Brittany Sykes off the bench, which is very awesome. And then Katie Lou Samuelson, who I talked about last week, had 13 points, which is really solid. She had two three-pointers as well, as unfortunately, that was only... That was all the Sparks made when it came to three-pointers. They only made three three-pointers, while Dallas made 11, and they still won. <laughs> Good for them. They only jacked up eight threes, though, so I can't really blame the Sparks all that much. But they were also without Ray Burrell, who had a knee injury, which... And then also, they were without Jordan Canada, who had a hamstring injury, so... Injuries have been piling up for the Sparks, but God knows, I hope they're able to turn it around. Last Sunday, and this was on Tuesday, by the way, last Sunday, the Sparks edged the Timberwolves, or not the Timberwolves, the Lynx, 85-83, to as they almost whiffed an entire a big lead, at, as Minnesota actually tied it up at 83 apiece, and then Neka Ogumike was able to score off of a putback with 7.3 seconds remaining to give the Sparks the win over the Lynx. Like I said, the Sparks led by 11 at halftime. They almost allowed the Lynx to come back, but fortunately they had the reigning cavalry of Neka Okumike as well as Chen- Chenady? Chenady Carter, who had 20 points leading the Sparks in that category. Liz Cambridge had 15 points, and Katie Lou Samuelson also chipped in 13 points. Once again, Katie Lou Samuelson led the Sparks in the three-point category, as in this game she had three three three-pointers, as the Sparks as a whole had a whopping five three-pointers. Meanwhile, for the Lynx, they only had four three-pointers, which I guess, thankfully, is a relief, because if they had more, then the Sparks would have lost. So before that two-game winning streak, the Sparks also had to deal with the Fever this past, last Friday as they lost that matchup 101-96, to which really was disheartening. That really wiped away a big game from Neka Ogumike as she had 30 points. Like, how does she have 30 points and the Sparks lose? Like, why? 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 And they also had... 19 points from Katie Lou Samuelson, which I, I really have to thank the Chicago Sky, Adam Karnick's team, for sending over or for sending away. Either way, Katie Lou Samuelson is doing great things for the Sparks, and I hope she's able to continue it. So, good on her. And I really think, I think the Sparks are getting back on track as they have a Big old match. Well, not a big old matchup, but they play the Phoenix Mercury on Sunday, and then they have the Las Vegas Aces next Sunday. As Adam actually says, the Sparks have a good matchup on Sunday against the Mercury. Yeah, I think the Mercury should be able. I think it should be a win for the Mercury for the uh, Sparks. They the Sparks should be able to handle the Mercury. Like, the matchup I kind of fear the most is the Aces matchup. While they did lose to the Connecticut Sun, I think the the Aces are still doing great things as they're still the best team in the WNBA, which is scary when you look at that. So, overall, as we also say hello to Cale Henderson, he says, what up? So, it's a perfect segue because... 
Kale hosts our Las Vegas show, Sin City Sports, and those Las Vegas aces are just wheeling and dealing. So overall, the Sparks still have quite a ways to go, but they're still doing good. They're only one month into their season. They still have plenty of season left as they have 25 matches remaining. I think they're able to turn it around, so there's that right there. So that is that for the WNBA. So iSports Radio has is having its what if week, and this show is basically no exception to that. There have been a lot of what ifs, and boy howdy, I have a lot of what ifs I can go off of. So let's start off with the NBA. So let's start off with the Lakers. What if the Lakers actually made the playoffs this year? Would Frank Vogel still keep his job? Maybe, but my. But to me, I think that was kind of a obvious what if. I think Frank Vogel would still lose his job, unfortunately, just because the Lakers have their heads up there, you know what, and they don't. They they're not looking at the big picture. It's not Frank Vogel's fault. The Lakers stunk. The players were getting banged up. LeBron was having to carry them at age thirty-eight. They hired. They signed a bunch of old guys, and more importantly, they basically just underperformed, and the Russell Westbrook's experiment backfired. The Lakers, I hope, could do big things with Darvin Ham as head coach. Um, Something else I need to get out of the way when it comes to the what-if category for the Lakers is what if the Lakers never traded Shaquille O'Neal? Would they have more NBA championships? So, honestly, I really... This is the biggest what-if. What if... Kobe and Shaq still remained on the team. What if they never had beef? I really want to say they would have had more NBA championships. I think they would have done great things. As It didn't help that the Lakers lost Phil Jackson as he semi-retired. And then they had to deal with Rudy Tom Jonovich, which I'm surprised I even remember that name, but... I do remember Rudy Tomjanovich just because I played a lot of NBA Live 2005. Um, Adam actually says an extension of his of his what ifs. What if the Kings never traded for Wayne Gretzky? Ooh, that's a very good one. If that were the case, then maybe Wayne Gretzky would have had a better send off because if I remember correctly, the Kings gave Wayne Gretzky the worst send off when it came to his swan song, but. I digress. We'll get into the Kings a little bit later, but um, going back to the Lakers, I really wish I could I could wonder what if the Lakers never traded Shaq. Like, maybe it would have been a whole different outcome. Maybe we would, we would be seeing the Lakers just continue its dominance. Maybe Phil Jackson doesn't leave. Like, maybe we don't see Miami win a championship. Like, it's just a big what if. And then what if, and then another what if for the Lakers is, what if Andrew Bynum never got hurt in the regular season before the playoffs? So this one has me, I've basically said this a million times. What if Andrew Bynum never got hurt? Like, he would be healthy for the Lakers come playoff time. The Lakers obviously cruised through their first three series, and then they got to the finals where they faced the Boston Celtics. Unfortunately, they did not have a proper big man, as they had to basically shift around, as they could have played Chris Mim at the five, but they decided to put, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, the Lakers put Lamar Odom on Kendrick Perkin. I want to say the Lakers put like Vladimir Rodmanovich on Kevin Garnett, Lamar Odom on Kendrick Perkins, and then Paul and then Kobe Bryant on Paul Pierce, and then Devin George on Ray Allen, and then Derek Fisher on Ray Sean Rondo. So I really have to wonder if Andrew Bynum was one hundred percent healthy, or at least healthy enough to play in the playoffs, I think the Lakers could have prevented the Celtics from winning the championship in two thousand eight. I disliked that, and that to me is my hugest what if. Arthur also mentions, what if the Lakers didn't give away their future for Anthony Davis? So, that's a really good what if. If that happens, what if that didn't, if they didn't give away their future? I think 
the Lakers don't I don't know if the Lakers win that uh NBA championship back in 2020. That is a huge what if, but then again, they could have the number 4 pick and who knows if they'll get Zion if they'd get Zion Williamson or whatnot. Like the sky's the limit and then who knows what they could have done with that number 4 pick. And who knows what they could have done with Lonzo Ball, but if they didn't give away their future for Anthony Davis, then they'd still have to deal with old man ball and whatnot. So that would be a thing right there. So jumping over to the Clippers, because I actually don't want to just stick around with the Lakers too long. So my what if for the Clippers is what if the Clippers actually defeated the Denver Nuggets in the 2020 NBA playoffs? What if they actually defeated the Nuggets in that best of seven series and they got to play in the western conference finals against the lakers what would happen then i feel it, anything could have happened i think it would have been electric to see the lakers versus the clippers in the western conference finals and that was that could have been another thing right there and to go back to the lakers and the clippers is what if the lakers had not blown a 3-1 lead against the phoenix suns back in 2006 like, would we? What would have happened in that series between the Lakers versus the Clippers? Like, would the Clippers have gotten past the Lakers? Would the Lakers, the seventh seed, gotten past the Clippers, which was the sixth seed? Like, that's the biggest what if for me. I really would have liked to have seen a Lakers versus Clippers matchup. And those two teams have never, ever, 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 ever met in the playoffs, to my knowledge. So. Overall, it's just a big what if, but back to the 2020 playoffs, what if the Clippers had beaten the Nuggets in that series? I think that would have prompted, I think that would have made everyone be more mindful of the Clippers, and then the Clippers would have gotten more respect, but instead, it's another black eye on the Clippers and how they're cursed, so... Boy, howdy. And this just goes to show that if the Clippers don't win anything in the next few years, then, honestly, the Clippers traded all that for all their picks, all their players, all their resources for Paul George and Kawhi. Well, they signed Kawhi, but they traded, They would have traded all of those resources for Paul George and then gotten nothing out of it. Adam says, has LeBron ever faced the Cavs in the NBA Finals? That would be fun. No, he hasn't. Without the Cavs, and this is no jab to the Cavaliers, without LeBron on the Cavs, the Cavs can't really hold their own. I, I'm, I don't mean to say that in a negative way, but it's kind of the truth. So that's pretty much my what-ifs for the NBA. Jumping to the NFL, oh, I'm going to have a lot of fun with this. What if? We'll start with the Rams. We'll start with the Rams first. What if the Rams had traded Jared Goff sooner and gotten Matt Stafford? My thing is, if he, if Matt Stafford would have faced Tom Brady or not, yeah, Tom Brady and the Patriots back in Super Bowl Fifty Two, that would have been quite the interesting matchup. Now we also got to remember that Cooper Cup was out the rest of the year that year, but honestly. That's my biggest what if. What if the Rams had traded Jared Goff sooner rather than later? So that's kind of my biggest what if. And I kind of presume – I kind of also kind of give this what if. What if Todd Gurley never got hurt? Like would Todd Gurley be still on the Rams? Would he be on any NFL team? Instead he's just floating around in free agency – and he's still trying to find a home. And it was sad that Todd Gurley had to get released by the L.A. Rams, but it had to be. And the poor guy got fired on his day off, which <laughs> he even said that on Twitter. And I felt so heartbroken for him. I'm like, gosh, dang it, poor guy. But, you know, NFL's a business. So that's kind of my thing. And my th- other what if, and this kind of attains to Matt Stafford and the Rams, is what if the Rams didn't win the Super Bowl? Like, what if they lost to the Bucks? What if they blew that 27-3 lead and then the Bucks advanced to the N- NFC Championship? 
Or what if the Rams lost to the Niners? Well, I'd be hearing the whole Niners fans saying, we own the Lambs, we still own the Lambs. Or we also have the whole what if of, what if the Rams lost to the Bengals in, sup- in the most recent Super Bowl? Well, I'd be hear- Well, I'd be hearing nothing but the Rams failed and their pick and experiment of Matt's them getting Matt Stafford backfired. So that's basically my what if, but we're not going to go down that what if because it didn't happen. And the Rams experiment for trading all their picks saying F them picks and then getting Matt Stafford actually worked. So, all right, now we're going to have some fun with, the Chargers, and um, I actually am trying to find the correct season for the Chargers, and I actually have the perfect, perfect, perfect what if for them, and oh my gosh, I have the I have the most perfect what if for them, and Adam says, if since he won that Super Bowl, the world would have ended. Ohio isn't allowed to have nice things. <laughs> that is a good one, Adam. Okay, but now I have the perfect Chargers what if. Obviously, everyone's going to say, well, what if the Chargers didn't move from San Diego? Well, then San Diego would still respect them and whatnot. That's the simple what if. But that's not my what if. So my what if for the Chargers is this is probably the biggest what if. Oh my goodness. Guys, 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 guys. So the Chargers, as we all know, in 2006, they went a whopping 14-2. and They were the best team in the NFL, and boy howdy, it looked they looked super, super duper promising. And honestly, it looked as if the Chargers were going to win. They were up 8, 21-13, as the Chargers were stopping Tom Brady and all of their and all of their offensive weapons in its in its tracks. And I really really thought that the Chargers were going to make it out of the playoffs. Then they they were able, but unfortunately for the Patriots and Bill Belichick, they had the formula as I'm trying to find this guy's name. Oh my, yes. I have this is the guy who I have on a wanted list from now until the end of time. Marlon McCree. So this happened when the Patriots were driving on in San Diego territory. They were on the 41-yard line. It was a fourth down attempt, and Tom Brady was intercepted by Marlon McCree. Chargers got the interception. They're going to win. So then Marlon McCree does the stupid thing, and he fumbles the interception as Troy Brown stripped it, and then Rich Caldwell recovered it, and then that was the game. Patriots eventually continued the drive. They got the touchdown. Chargers missed a super long field goal. Game over. Chargers 14-2 season was all for naught. That's my biggest what if. What if Marlon McCree did not fumble? That is my biggest what if. If he did not fumble, Chargers go on to win that game. They go on to win the AFC Championship, possibly. And they possibly go on to face the Bears and possibly go on to win the Super Bowl, and then we can get those people shutting up about how the Chargers are basically little brother in the AFC West. That's my biggest what if for the Chargers. <laughs> so I'll speed along through the other what ifs. What if the Angels actually had better pitching? Then they wouldn't be so trash. If they had better pitching, they wouldn't be 27 and 25. They would actually be decent. They would be chasing the Astros. They wouldn't be so far behind. Mike Trout would actually have a playoff win if the Angels had decent pitching. And then what if the Dodgers beat the Astros who cheated? We wouldn't be hearing the Astros or Trash Throws joke. And more importantly, we would be hearing the... Well, the Dodgers would be hailed as gods for beating a cheating Astros team. But if the Astros lost to the Dodgers in that World Series in which the Astros won, where they cheated, we would be hearing nothing but the end of the Astros lost the World Series, even though they cheated, and the Dodgers are gods. There you go. (laughs) And now let's jump to the NHL. What if the Ducks 
uh, the Ducks one is kind of tough because I have a plethora of Ducks ones. What if the Ducks didn't sign old farts to their team? Their team this year would have actually been good. Their team this year actually would have made the playoffs. And their team this year would have actually given fans in Anaheim something to cheer about. And then for the Kings, I have, well, Adam brought up the whole Wayne Gretzky thing. That was kind of an interesting one. And if the Kings didn't sign Wayne Gretzky, I think Gretzky has a better send-off. But my biggest what-ifs for the Kings are, is what if the Kings actually close out the series against Edmonton? Would the Oilers be able to, uh, I forget who the Oilers lost to in this series, as I haven't been paying attention to the NHL, just because... Boy, howdy, them losing really kind of... T- oh, well, no, the Oilers are still in the playoffs, and they they lost to the Avalanche. My thing is, if the Kings beat the Oilers, then would the Kings... What if the Kings beat the Oilers? Would they have had better luck against the Calgary Flames? That's kind of my food for thought right there, so... Yeah, it's something I'll never... <laughs> Adam says Kings would not have survived round two. Yeah, I kind of agree just because Calgary is good. So, yeah, I forgot how good Calgary was. And I forgot rivalry games are can go either way when it comes to the Oilers and the... Well, not rivalry games, but interstate rivals or intercountry rivals. But either way, I think Adam makes a great point. Kings would not have survived round two. And then also, what if the Kings did not become one of the few eight seeds to win the Stanley Cup back in 2012? Like, what if the Kings just fell flat on their face in the first round or the second round or the conference finals or the finals? Well, then, first of all, the Kings would have only one Stanley Cup. Second of all, the Kings would have – nothing would have happened. But now, but that 2012 season was super special for the Kings. The Kings were hailed as gods that year as they became an eight, they were the eight seed, they beat the one seed, and then they just ran from there. And then also, I guess this is another what if, but this is coming from the Northern California side of things. What if the San Jose Sharks didn't blow a 3 nothing lead against the Kings? Would the Kings have been able to take down whoever they face in the playoffs. Was it the Ducks? I think it was the Ducks, I want to say, but (laughs) I think we wouldn't have... I think San Jose wouldn't be... I think San Jose would have... I want to say this was back in 2014 when the Kings won it all, but I do remember the Sharks blowing a 3-0 lead to the Kings, and then every Kings fan was ruthless to the Sharks, and the Sharks fans were even ruthless to the Sharks. So, Ab says Calgary was really good, and I totally agree, so there is that right there. So, that's going to do it for my what-ifs. Before we head out, we have to crown our Dumb Dumb of the Week. So, the Dumb Dumb of the Week award goes out to someone who does something really dumb. It could be anyone that gets Dumb Dumb of the Week. I'm just going to mash it. I actually have two Dumb Dumbs of the Week, but I'm just going to mash it all into one little Dumb Dumb of the Week, and I'm just going to give it to them all basically as is. So first of all, this the first Dumb Dumb of the Week comes from probably last from last week when Anthony Siegler backflipped a ball off the wall, and this was the Yankees' 2018 first-round draft pick. And Anthony Siegler bat-flipped a ball, which went off the wall. And normally that's going to be considered a double 95% of the time. Well, let's just say that 5% happened when the, the 5%, which wasn't a double, turned out to be an out. As Anthony Siegler doubled, and then he was thrown out at second. Yeah, poor Anthony Siegler. He basically got thrown out at second, and he bat-flipped, he bat-flipped and then... He got thrown out, which was gosh darn funny. And if only the Yankees were like this. Like, if the Yankees were like this, then the Angels would have at least taken one, if not two, against them. But Anthony Siegler bat-flipped, which was funny. And this was in a minor league game, mind you. So, yeah, poor Anthony Siegler. I feel bad for you, but not really. So, 
He's kind of the mini Dum Dum of the Week, but he kind of deserves the honor of full Dum Dum of the Week. Now for the other full Dum Dum of the Week. So I was unaware of this, but on Wednesday, my boy Marcus Los Great informed me that there was a big fight that happened in UFC action. We had Gervonta Tank Davis taking on Roly Rolverez. Rolverez? I'm sorry. Roly Rolverez if I'm pronouncing that correct, but I, I, I'm pronounced it's Roly something. Roly Romero. So Roly Romero and Gervonta Tank Davis took on one another in UFC. Basically, Gervonta Tank Davis won, but Roly Romero gave him a hell of a fight. Excuse my French, but Roly Romero gave Gervonta Tank Davis all that he could handle. So that was that. So that, that why, So now you're probably wondering... Why is that Dumb Dumb of the Week? So, the match itself wasn't Dumb Dumb of the Week. What happened afterward was Dumb Dumb of the Week. So, these idiots decided to loot after the whole fight between Tank Davis and Rolly Ramiro in New York. Keep in mind, this was played in... The match was at New York, at, Mass, at I think, Madison Square Garden. But looters, after the Rolly ramiro Gervonta tank Davis fight, looted... All over New York. Okay, you just put a big black eye on a great night in UFC. You decided to do something that stupid, and honestly, it's sickening. I, I, Marcus totally agreed with me, and I basically said, well, looks like I found Dumb Dumb of the Week, and boy howdy. It's like, how do you do something that dumb? You not only do something dumb, which gets you arrested, but you ruined a great night in the world of combat sports and boxing. Like, I hope and I pray to the Holy Lord that these looters get ro- get caught and they hopefully return everything, but I hope those looters get caught and I hope they pay for it dearly. I am so mad. I could not believe that they ruined such a great night in combat sports after a great fight between Rolly Ramiro and Gervonta Tank Davis. But to those looters and Anthony Siegler, well, to the looters that looted all over New York, and to Anthony Siegler, who had that bat flip, you are this week's Dumb Dumb of the Week Award recipients. You are so dumb. You are really dumb. For real. (laughs) (laughs) And that, my friends, is all she wrote. You know the old saying... If you can't do the time, don't do the crime. And honestly, those looters did the crime. On that note, that is going to do it for this week's episode of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. I apologize if I had to speed through everything. We do have another show coming up in approximately four minutes. So let's get on out of here because my voice is shot and we have the debut of North North Star Sports. You dig? Thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone, for tuning in to the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. I really do appreciate you all tuning in. If you listen live, I appreciate you. If you listen on the playback, I appreciate you. If you listen at work, I appreciate you. If you listen to the media, I definitely appreciate you. Big shout out to Jeff, Adam Carnick, Arthur Carson, Kale Henderson, and. Did I get everybody? Mike Pack. I can't forget about Mike Pack. I appreciate everybody that tuned in. And thank you to Adam for his insight. I really do appreciate it. Really thing, buddy. Everyone else that I do, I appreciate that. I really do. I appreciate your support. I appreciate you all. That's my second thing. For everyone here at Ice Sports Radio, this is Terry Rodriguez signing off. Love well, yourselves. Have a great rest of the week. Don't do anything dumb over the weekend. Be good people. Take care of your bodies. Take care of y'all chickens. I will see you Monday for a set point. Yes, set point. Stay